As long as we've been able, humans have used language, words, to talk about their location. Uluru, from the Wati languages of Central Australia. Mitsi Adazi, from the Hidatsa language of North America, which translated into English as Yellowstone River. Chomulungma, or Mother of the Universe, the, the first name for what we call Mount Everest. Going back thousands of years, places have been assigned names that were often based on geographical features or cultural resonance that distinguished them from other locations. As we became more mobile, traveling from one part of the world to another, a need to be more specific in our labeling of locations developed. We had to find our way back to a particular place or tell someone with little local knowledge how to get there. As our infrastructures became more sophisticated, language was used to differentiate not only between the settlements, but the roads and houses within them. Knowing where you are on land is one thing, but once we started sailing across the oceans, a whole new problem needed to be solved. It was the ancient Greeks who first proposed a grid where numbers could describe the intersections between longitudinal and latitudinal lines, even in the middle of the ocean. It took until the 17th century to refine the technology required for, for lat-long coordinates, but once it did, this revolutionized navigation and map-making forever. Poor street addressing was the next major hurdle. In 19th century Britain, gripped by the Industrial Revolution, time was money, but email still 150 years away, and delays in contacting people was a huge problem. Language-based address systems had developed over many years, and in a very localized way, people weren't too concerned if the name of a new road or city duplicated one that was already in another part of the world. In fact, as an example, there are over 1,000 church roads in the UK, <laughs> and 14 in London alone. So in 1836, the first postcodes were made of letter and number combinations, which were created to complement the language of addressing. Words, as they used to be used, human-friendly but potentially limited in their scope, while numbers or technology push the boundaries but are potentially not human-friendly enough. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is that words, when combined with technology, can provide as much accuracy as numbers, and in moments of stress or uncertainty, can be even more reliable. Fast forward a few more years and technological advances to 2013. In fact, this time we're going to Italy. We're following a British wedding band as they head to a gig. Unfortunately, due to a confusion in similar street addresses and the driver unwittingly selecting the wrong one on his sat-nav, they unloaded all the equipment an hour north of Rome, where, in fact, they're meant to be an hour south of Rome. And on a slightly worse day, when a keyboard player called his agent and said, Chris, don't panic, but I think we might have just sound-checked at the wrong wedding. <laughs> After experiencing several frustrating situations like this, Chris, in the London office, realised that perhaps addressing as it was just wasn't good enough. In the pursuit of precision, he tried sharing GPS coordinates, but soon realized that relying on humans to type these into a device or to share, or to share them over a t t telephone call can pretty easily go wrong. Accidentally type just two numbers the wrong way round, and you're heading to the wrong location without any way of knowing that you are. So Chris met up with a mathematician school friend to find a way to describe location that would be as precise as coordinates, but easier for humans to use. Could we, in fact, go right back to basics? What could be more natural to humans than words? 
We've been using them to talk about location since our very earliest days. And many studies show that humans are better at remembering words than at numbers. Words, by the very fact that they contain meaning, provide us with a hook to grab onto, some tangible key. So if we divided the entire surface of the globe up into three by three meter squares and assigned each one its own unique identifier using three words, no numbers here, could that work? Three randomly generated words, nothing intended to describe the place, they would simply be the blocks to build a new human-centric coordinate system. For example, the Rose Theatre in Kingston is located at 24 to 26 High Street, Kingston upon Thames, London, KT1, 1HL. Or if you want the long coordinates for that, I haven't even tried to remember them. <laughs> but, and I can remember this one, the what three words address, flood, camps, cloud, leads you right to the front door. If you need the artist's entrance or the loading bay, you can find another three words to take you to that exact place. I'm currently standing at Drift, for fortunate leader, and I quite like those words, so I'm going to leave them up there for a minute. <laughs> this isn't only useful for street dressing or to tell somebody how to get to the right house, as every single three meter square on the globe has its own unique address, you can tell your friends what part of a large beach to meet you on or find your way back to your tent at a crowded music festival. More seriously, being able to apply what few words to street dressing can be a game changer in parts of the world where this is less developed. A favela in Rio de Janeiro won't have house numbers or street names, but a what few words address can get a delivery man right to the front door. Imagine being involved in a car accident on an unfamiliar country road. How are you going to tell the 999 call handler where to send the ambulance to? Here in the UK, most of our emergency service providers now accept what three words addresses, and we've heard of loads of stories where they're actually being used right now to save lives. Words are all around us. They're with us every day, they're even saving lives, we use them all the time. But I have a slightly paradoxical relationship with words, and I wanted to just uh, touch on that now. As a child with a bad stammer, communication was often stressful. My stammer particularly uh, used to trip me up because it's not always the same sounds that I have a problem with on any particular time, so it's quite hard to predict. I often, however, had a particular problem with the J sound, which, when your name is J Jamie, can be <laughs> quite <laughs> stressful. <laughs> Many stammerers have this constant internal dialogue playing in their minds, jumping forward in conversations to identify potential problem words and uh, try to find a way out of having to use them. To give you an example, if the letter F is proving troublesome to you today, you might preemptively swap the word film for movie. That's pretty easy. Hopefully you're not having a problem with the M sound as well, otherwise you're going to have to um, move the entire conversation around to try to fit to what you need to say. I actually once likened this to canoeing down a mountain stream full of boulders. You can see a short way in front of you, and to some extent, you can plot your path to avoid the obstacles. But this can be stressful when you're also concentrating on keeping paddling without capsizing, getting to where you need to be. And also, sometimes those boulders are simply too big too unavoidable, or you've gone so far out of your way to steer clear of them that you can hardly remember what you were trying to say in the first place. Maintaining a conversation as, as a stammerer can sometimes feel just like that. Even though I have it a, a, a bit more controlled nowadays, I've been doing this many times over the last 10 minutes alone, which, when trying to stick to a script that you've spent months of your life lovingly crafting, uh, that can also get slightly annoying. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, for me, this constant internal negotiation reinforced two really strong beliefs. Firstly, that words are a never-ending supply of building blocks, ready to be constructed in whatever way you need to construct them at the time. But also, words are beautiful. They're a privilege. They're something you should never take for granted. The fact that I found them hard at times actually only reinforced my conviction of how precious they really are. And as a child, all this thinking about words all the time led to an obsession with other languages. Did they work in the same way as English? What slots in where and how? How are words created? I spent a lot of time learning new languages one by one. Maybe I was looking for the language in which I didn't have a stammer anymore, but unfortunately there isn't one. I learned, for example, that the Icelandic language has this really fascinating approach to coining new words. Lots of languages, when you need to talk about something new, some new technology or something like that, but borrow the word from some other language to talk about it. Icelanders, however, have this great way of coining new words that are based on old or potentially forgotten vocabulary from their past. So, for example, their word for computer, tölva, is a combination of the words, uh, the, the, the words number and priestess. Anyway, so I went on to, to, to study linguistics. I worked in the language industry as a teacher, then as a translator. I learned more about how languages both facilitate communication, but can also bind you to a community or a shared history. Your native language is part, of your sh is part of your identity, and it helps connect you to new concepts, new innovations. So when I first came across What Few Words, I, like a lot of people, I think, had a very strong reaction to it, but maybe slightly different to other people's. Mine went, number one, wow, what an incredible, intuitive idea. It's so simple. I started thinking about all the ways in which it could be useful in my life or in the lives of others. I wonder what the three words for my front door at home are, obviously. And then number two, actually mind-blowing that here's a company that is using words in the way that I've privately always th thought of them myself as building blocks. <laughs> beautiful artisan blocks, but still. And then lastly, for such a transformational concept with the ability to change lives around the world, it's absolutely essential that people have access to it in a language that they are comfortable using, i.e. not necessarily English. So to cut a long story short, I joined the company and we built a framework to achieve exactly that. Seven years later, What Three Words has launched its 50th language version. Each and every one is built from scratch. It isn't translated because you can't neatly translate one word in a language into one word in every other language. But this also helps us to tailor each one to the people who are really going to be using it. We work with a large team of native speakers of each language who we ask to look at their language as building blocks, like we do, but also end up constructing something that feels completely natural. They help to identify the most appropriate words in their language. Not every language is constructed the same, so we talk about grammar and simplicity of words, which words we can use to ensure that the new language version will be user-friendly and not confusing. We do as much as we can to remove negative or culturally insensitive words from the product, which this can vary from language to language. What one community finds unacceptable isn't always correlating to some other community. And we talk about this at length to ensure that our product provides a really high quality experience. Everything my team does is geared towards unlocking what few words technology for everyone in the world not just those who speak English. Throughout our history, language has cut to the very core of what it means to be human. And while the world is even more connected than it's ever been, it should be our goal 
that everyone is able to access technology of any form in the language of their choice. I think it can sometimes feel that technology is taking over the world, pushing humans away from the core of our own experience. But I think that technology and language can actually can, can work together in rather beautiful ways to enable each other, blending thousands of years of advancement in both fields to arrive at elegant solutions that are practical, intuitive, and potentially life-saving. Thank you very much.